Well, hello, Windsor. Um, as you know, if you've been following along, this is our weekly Westminster Confession of Faith uh, discussion. With the so we're looking forward to that. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right in. So, yes. dear Lord, we uh, thank you for um, those who have gone before us, and uh, you have inspired, uh, first off, to write your word, and we treasure the scripture that is the Bible. Um, and we thank you for those who have uh, continued in the faith that you have upheld. And um, as we look at these words today, and we um, come together about um, understanding more deeply the doctrines that are in your word, we just ask that you would open our minds to understand your scripture and for our hearts to be receptive to what um, we have in store for us today. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. I will, I will read the first paragraph. And then um, actually before Al reads his first proof text, um, we can make sure we have clarity of what the passage is saying. And then we'll dive into the text. So this is of religious worship and the Sabbath day, paragraph one. The light of nature shows that there is a God who has lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and does good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, served with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might. Sorry, the simple way of worshiping the true God, squinting there, God is instituted by himself and limited by his own revealed will, that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. Excellent. Um, I is it clear? Is, is it uh, generally understandable? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think some of these comments came out in your sermon today. I, that top mm. I was thinking that too when I, I read it before we started. Anyway, the first pr proof text that uh, helps us is a very clear uh, representation of what the Westminster divines are saying. And it comes from Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Of course, Paul is talking about uh, people in general here, but specifically uh, those who uh, maybe have rejected God. But uh, he's, he's talking about God's invisible attributes. Uh, and uh, that's, that's his nature. All his attributes comprise his nature. And that there is a God. And, and some of these attributes have been listed here in paragraph one. Lordship, sovereignty, goodness, does good unto all, uh, should be feared, loved, praised. And that defines the relationship that Paul is alluding to here in Romans 1. Good, thank you, Al. Mm -hmm. And then everything that follows but until we get to the B is for that first. Um, Correct. The first long sentence. Yeah. Uh, okay. These uh, proof texts right now end here with this little A in parentheses. Mm -hmm. And then we'll make a note when we transition to the second half of paragraph one. Good. Ray? All right. Acts 17. Acts 17, uh, 24. Um, for God made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, uh, nor is served by human hands, but as though he needs anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and uh, everything. And uh, is, it, is this part of Paul's uh, sermon 
on the uh, Athens. Yeah, in Athens, the Mount. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, and he's speaking in reference, of course. The context is the uh, the Greeks uh, who he walked into the marketplace and he just saw statues upon statues, and uh, so he knew that the uh, <clears throat> those in the uh, who were attending who invited him to speak knew that there were gods, but Paul's talking about the God, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. I'm speaking in reference to these statues that they they worshipped, I think, uh, going in there, and um, him defining, uh, you know, how he's worshipped, uh, and saying he made everything. He, he doesn't live in temples, and, and boy, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a, just thinking back, as God reveals himself uh, progressively through scriptures, you know, in the, uh, you know, as he speaks to the patriarchs and is above the cloud as the cloud rains uh, manna and, and whatnot over those, yeah, boy, there's just all kinds of uh, just things that are going through my mind, but I'm going to stop right there, you know, and, uh, and yeah. I just wanted to say also this uh, particular passage could also serve as a proof text uh, under part B because uh -huh. with worship according to the imaginations and devices of men uh, and you know God is God is above all of this you know he created everything he is not subjected to us we are subjected to him indeed. I think yeah. you're right, Gordon. And what yeah. what he, it seems to be uh, saying and the establishing in this first paragraph is that God is God, and we are not. He calls the shots, including in worship. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a point I guess that we could talk about for a long, long time. You know, one of the problems yeah. that all of us face, uh, especially as we try to you know to share our faith with with unbelievers everybody has an idea of how god should behave and, and how he should conduct him, himself and how he should deal with us and so forth and so on you know we, we have no say in the matter whatsoever and one of the things that i really like about uh, uh i think you know i think it was in the first passage that uh there is nothing uh that we could provide to god that would be acceptable to him in terms of obligating him in some way to us what he does is for his own good pleasure and he he wants to do good because he chooses to do good you know not because we've earned anything you know so it's a yeah it's it's an amazing thing and and it's very difficult to understand i i also thought of psalm 8 on this one too uh in that you know he's not you know he's not residing or living in temples he is above creation he's above all that he has made uh -huh. yeah. Good. All right, let's go to Psalm 119 and Phil Marks. Uh, I think I'm just reading the underline, but the heart of it comes through in all of it. You, you are good and do good. This is obviously speaking, referring to Yahweh. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Um, huh. So, you know, again, in the first half of the paragraph, um, when we see through nature, that there is a God um, and that he is good. And the response is, so I trust in and serve him. Um, therefore, teach me your statutes so that I might serve you. I think, it, I think it's interesting how we, uh, when we see good, we're drawn to it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. All right, we have John. Carmichael reading Jeremiah 10. Okay. Um, who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. Yeah. Exactly the position that God is. There is none like him. I was talking with someone recently and it was amazing. Uh, their view of God is that he's there to do the things that we want. You know, you've got it exactly backwards. Uh, we're there to do what he wants, not him serve us. Uh -huh. He is the king of everything. There is none like him. Well said. 
Well said. And I think if we scroll down, we have, we have Gordon reading Psalm 31. Uh -huh. In verse 23, yeah. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Uh, certainly that does align very closely with uh, what is written in paragraph one and part A. Uh -huh. uh, God reminds us continually that, you know, he, he expects that because of his, his goodness and his greatness and his majesty, he is deserving of, of our love and praise and he, uh, he deserves it. And uh, as a result, uh, he will preserve us who are faithful to him. But I think there's a warning also captured here at the end. You know, he's going to abundantly repay the one who acts in pride. We all have a ten, you know, have, have a tendency to forget sometimes uh, that, you know, we can be prideful. Uh, and uh, this is a passage that reminds us of that. You know, everything that is good that happens to us, God is the author of it. He has made it that way. And uh, we should be thankful for any goodness that we have in our life, uh, honoring the one who gave it to us. Amen. Okay, next we have uh, Psalm 18.3 and Rick Bassler, or no, myself, actually. Psalm 18.3, and then Rick, you'll be next, just to keep the order. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Hmm. Well, he is worthy to be praised. I think that's the the heart of why this is included. Yeah. Yeah. Plus also, Pastor, a, a good God who loves his children, the, the humans who believe in him and, and worship mm -hmm. him, are also protected from, the, from Satan, enemies, uh, people who would cause harm to come to him. Mm -hmm. So uh, not only... It's just another one of, of God's uh, wonderful, amazing, and awesome attributes. And yeah. that he's worthy. And, and, but he also acts in, in the way that is good for his, for his uh, people who trust in him and who, who, uh, who love him and, and fear him. Right. Yeah. And, and that word worthy is... Um... It's, it's helpful to just get a basic understanding if, you know, if, um, if, uh, let's say you, um, you see an ice cream stand and you know, the ice cream is really, really good ice cream and it's $5 for an ice cream cone from that place, but you know, it's really, really good. Then you say, well, it's, it's $5, but it is worth it. It is worth every penny. Um, that's a, that's a simple, really simple explanation, but. God is worthy of praise and he's worthy of all praise. He, it is right and is good. He is worth every bit of praise, every bit of honor that we can give him. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think of the passage of God is for us who can be against us. Uh, there's nothing that the enemy is going to be able to do ultimately in the end to defeat God's will and purpose for our lives. And, that's something to, to be very thankful for. Also. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to Romans 10, 12, and Rick Bassler. Starting at verse 11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Mm -hmm. while you all are thinking uh i'm going to ask a question this passage there are there are a number of passages uh that we find in the new testament that deal with salvation uh this one is uh, a little more on the general side and i guess the question then is what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved? If we call on the Lord and we are then 
acknowledging our relationship with him to call on him if we didn't have a relationship with with god we wouldn't call upon him so for those who has a relationship with the lord then we are granted the bestowing of riches which might come in the form of grace mercy protection being saved from our enemies all kinds of things that god affords those who who love him i i was paying attention to uh psalm 31 23 there up just up above the the one who acts in pride and trying to get my head around what that pride means um and it's a self-reliance and we see it come up again in here in romans 12 all who call on him that idea of calling is to appeal to 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 reach out to and acknowledge our lack of ability to be self-reliant um it, to me that's the heart of all of this that's coming through right now is because that god has lordship and sovereignty and we are here um the only way to be saved is to call out to him to to, to put our trust in him I, I think that gets to it phil i uh i was also looking you know looking as i asked the question i was looking to the left in the beginning of the paragraph one and i think that just captures what you just said you know if if you do fear God, if you do love God and praise him, then it says he is called upon, trusted in, and served. You know, so when you're called upon him, you are trusting in him. You know, I think that's, and when you trust in him, he is your Lord and Savior and your guide, you know. And I think that gets it, Phil. I think you're right. Uh -huh. Yep, I think that's, that's well said, Phil. Uh, that was a very clear summary. Uh, in the context of Romans 10 as well, it is the response of faith. And so that um, appealing to him for salvation and calling on him, is, as Phil explained, is a response of coming to believe that he is who he is, everyone who believes in him. And um, that, is, that is how a person is justified before God. And that is what defines a Christian. It is, it is having that trust that we exercise humanly fixed on Christ. And so the response of calling on him, as Phil described, is, is um, just what we have there. Good. Okay. Um, let's keep moving. And we're back up to Al. For Psalm 62. For Yeah, that uh, talks about uh, what we should do. Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. That kind of speaks for itself. Uh, it's uh, what, what our response should be for God's wonderful, amazing attributes. The Westminsters tell us that we should trust in God, and uh, and then and He would will be our refuge. Mm -hmm. uh, the next uh, is uh, Ray with uh, Joshua twenty four. Joshua uh, so twenty four fourteen, and I'll read, read uh, through the. Uh, uh, to the end, it, it, I, I think it gives it, uh, puts it in context as well. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and your faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. Uh, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you dwell. But as for me and uh, my house, we will serve the Lord and Joshua, you know, charging Israel uh, and, you know, and for saying, who will you serve? And I, you know, reflecting back, I think they're using that, the iterative verb there, serve, uh, 
who we are going to serve and we should serve the Lord, not only uh, uh, praise him, have faith in him, trust in him, but also serve in him is, uh, I believe, what uh, they're, they're going for there in the confession. I would thank you for that passage. Uh, I, thought, I think Joshua was a very powerful leader uh, in his day. And uh, he also reminds us that you can't have it both ways. You have to pick one. Yeah, that's good. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think we have John Carmichael. Or no, we have Phil next. Phil. With, uh, uh, Mark. Mark. Mark 12, it's a familiar passage of uh, the scribe asking him the most important commandment. And I'll just read the underlined. And, and uh, the scribe answers Jesus. Um, uh, and to love him, that's God, with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. We could spend a lot of time on just this, this verse, but um, certainly in the context of, of this part, this paragraph of the confession, it really gets back to, again, the response that there is a God. I, I keep coming back to the, the light of nature shows that there is a God. I think the light of nature is really a defining point for believers and unbelievers because unbelievers look at nature and they either reject mm. that God created or they acknowledge that he did and they reject God. But either way, the light of nature is, is the first thing to point to him. Uh, I think that's why Genesis starts off the way it does. Um, and to, therefore, as Gordon said, you gotta choose, right? And, um, and, it, and choosing, loving him is much more than than uh burnt offerings and sacrifices so what's interesting about this passage uh jesus is in the temple this is right before his uh his crucifixion uh and he this is uh he had been asked many questions that were trying to trap him and you guys might remember it. every one of them of course you know he slammed those guys to the to the ground with his response. But this one, one question, which was the last question from the crowd before he spent the remainder of his time with his disciples, uh, he acknowledged it as, as being a good and right question. And uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, he also reminded that individual that when you understand this, you are close to the kingdom of God. Uh, and, you know, it gets back to you know, the very first part of this passage, you know, we, we are to love God, you know, and give him his just uh, due as, as one who is worthy of all of our worship and all of our praise. And uh, if we can do that, we're in a good place. Amen. All right, now we're going to the next sentence. And that is what begins, but the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations, and devices of men, or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in Holy Scripture. And John is reading our first passage from Deuteronomy 12:32. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. No, uh, or in, I'm sorry, go down to Matthew 15, 9. You hypocrites, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, and but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. John, we we didn't need to read Matthew 15 there, but um, but it certainly applies. Okay. The the uh, first uh, proof text is just Deuteronomy 12. Okay. All right. 
Well, they fit together, don't they? They're um, <laughs> they're both saying like we we worship the way God says and not in any other way. Uh huh. But we in so, uh, in the proof text, it was a separate. Uh, since this is dealing with the Sabbath, uh, what this pass, this one passage in Matthew reminds me of is, you know, how the Jews, uh, the religious leaders of, of the day, spent a great deal of time trying to define, you know, what what it meant to work on the Sabbath. You know, mm -hmm. again, they added to, uh, you know, the letter of the law and, you know, the spirit of the law was already well in place. You know, I think that's something that we always have to be careful of. You know, God does not need our help, especially when it comes to things of this nature. When it comes to worship, we are to do what he says and not try to uh, to give him any assistance. He doesn't need it. Yeah, we're not going to improve on God. We can only, we can yeah. only, yeah. Yeah. If we add to it, we only add what ought not to be added. And if we take away from it, we... We, we only take away what is good. You know, it's, uh, w one other quickie comment on this. Uh, as we have the opportunity to share our faith, and I hope that all of us uh, will have that opportunity more and more in the days ahead. You know, one of the things I really love about Scripture is you know, when Scripture says something, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I can share it. And if, if somebody has a problem with it, I just, I'm going to tell them to take it up with God. I mean, that's what he said. All right. That's not what I think. It's what he said. And, you know, if he said it, you know, that's the end of it. And that's, that's it, you know, so, you know, deal it with him, you know, not with me. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, Gordon, you're up for Acts 17, 25. Hey, uh, what, one more comment on the yeah. Deuteronomy 12. That yep. whole chapter has to do with uh, God's uh, uh, instructions for worship. Mm -hmm. That's how it begins. Uh, it begins in, in verse one. These are the statute and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, your God, your fathers have, have given you to possess. And then it, it launches on on a number of things, but many of them have to do with burnt offerings and the way we as his people are to worship. So that whole right. chapter, Deuteronomy 12, is applicable to this topic here in, in uh, chapter 21 of the divines so al you're saying that if um if uh, levi the levite shows up but his offering is actually um it only has uh three legs and it had uh, th a, th a third horn right. that grew out of its head but he said it's okay I, I i feel like god understands um god would have said i meant what i said <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. Okay. It, don't add from it or take from it. it it's it, observe the letter of what God has has uh, stated, and it was rather clear. It's rather clear in uh, in Deuteronomy twelve. You see words. You see phrases like "you shall not" or "you shall." Uh, but when you go over the Jordan and live in the land to inherit, uh, I'm giving you to inherit. When he gives you rest, then, and it tells you what you must do. There's a whole, it, it's a, uh, it's a command list from God. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, okay. it, they, these things all define the acceptable way of worshiping the one true God. And that yeah, these yeah. things are instituted by God himself and must be obeyed. You know, it's uh, uh, also uh, an issue uh, that there is a tendency, you know, in your example, Pastor, that uh, what what we give God is something that we have left over, you know, and it's not really a sacrifice as much as it is. I have to give something. So, you know, let me re-gift this thing that I have that really doesn't mean that much to me. You know, when, when you get right down to it, what does God require of me? He requires everything. He requires my life. He requires my service. He requires my worship constantly and uh it's not if i have a little bit left over i should give that to him i give him my best because that's what he deserves okay huh. act 17 25, i think that we have already read this passage but apparently uh the westminster divines uh appear to believe that it also applies to 
part B of, of this particular paragraph. Uh, it's Acts 1725, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. You know, God's uh, dwelling place is, is the preceding passage, passage indicates is not something that, you know, that we have created for him. He doesn't need our help uh, to develop something for him. Uh, he is the one uh -huh. of all life of mankind and everything that's in it. And we have to recognize that uh, and, and worship him accordingly as the creator. Very good. Okay, next uh, we have a passage from Matthew 4. And of course, this is the temptation where Satan tempts Jesus to to uh, worship him. And he says, and he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve and him only shall you serve. You, sir. There's, um, I remember reading a commentary by uh, Sinclair Ferguson on this passage about what was Satan, what was the real temptation here? What did Satan really have to offer Jesus? And it was the dominion that Adam lost, which Jesus was regaining, so that after his resurrection, Jesus could say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He is, he is God, and he has regained the dominion that man lost. And then, um, what he's really offering here, Sinclair Ferguson explained, is Satan could have could have uh, turned over uh, the kingdom of this world by um, decree, giving it to uh, Jesus, and then um, short circuiting the work of redemption and short circuiting, um, you know, what had been prophesied, and Jesus. Um, you know, he relied on God's word and he trusted in that. And he quoted Deuteronomy here again, back to the devil. But Satan was trying to get him to worship a way that is not right. And Jesus corrected him on that very basic point. And anyone can understand that we are only supposed to worship God. And if anyone tells us anything else, that's wrong. Okay, and so next is Rick, the next passage. Uh, Deuteronomy 4.15. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of a male or female likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you will be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the people under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be people of his own inheritance, as you are this day. I put in parentheses at the beginning that this was Moses speaking, and he's talking about the uh, idolatry being for, forbidden. Yeah. A good summary. Yeah. All right, Al, I think you have Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. I do. And uh, this is the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is, under, that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. 
you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Well, since it's the second commandment, there's not a whole lot we can say about this, but uh, it, it reiterates the, the previous passage regarding um, the um, Moses and the and idolatry. So this uh, is a a um, a codification, if you will, against the the previous uh, instructions. And it, God thought it was so important that He made it the second commandment. After you shall have no other gods, you know, this is you have should not have any gods before me. So um, it really speaks for itself. Good. Again, God giving us instruction in how to worship. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a quick question um, on this commandment uh, where God says uh, at the end there, uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Does it stop at the fourth generation? I, I think that, yeah, someone else want to weigh in, I can, I can answer too. It almost seems like, um, no, I think it was a, a metaphor for that. Uh, it, it just keeps on going. If, for those who hate me, he, but I, I could be wrong. Well, I think, I think that there's something to it. It, it, um, it's not specific when it does say that, um, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Um, I don't think that this is a, um, a specific, um, like a guarantee of what will be because the contrast is strong between the thousands and the third or fourth. So you're looking at one, a fraction of 1% of the punishment that God gives. And you do see, you do see that sin, sin ripples out, but um, the blessings of God, I think is by contrast to be understood as so abundant. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, you can't really put it into an equation. You can see someone that faithfully walks with the Lord and, and lives a life in, in faith in Christ, and then they can have children that turn away. Um, and, um, and, and the opposite is also true. And then Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel 18, where the parable of the sour grapes, and God says, no, it's it's this generational sin idea is, is, you know, overturned where God says, no, the soul who sins, that one shall die. But if someone, if someone walks in my ways, that person will live, but the person that sins, that person will die. So just a little, um, mm -hmm. you know, all the Bible comments is the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Okay. Uh, we have, we have one more passage here in Colossians chapter three, and I believe Phil is up. Oh, okay. Um, Colossians 2.23. Uh, I'll read it all. If, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Um, so this is, this is really wrapping up the second half of the first paragraph, which is God gives um, the acceptable way of worshiping him and these other things that man institutes, uh, while they may have some, I'll say, pragmatic benefit in, you know, uh, 
health or something like that, uh, there are no value in um, there are no uh, no value in terms of worshiping God. Mm. Yeah, nor are they prescribed in the Holy Scripture. Right. Uh, so that's it. The um, it's interesting the contrast here. I John Piper wrote an article about this that. Um, when we use things like asceticism or severity of the body um, or things that seem to have the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion, um, Pipe, John Piper says, this is like fighting tanks with a pea shooter. And um, cause the point that the point that he's making here is uh, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Um, they're a type of, of um, human effort and legalism, which can't stop. They can't get to the real issue, which is the sinful nature. And the sinful nature can only be put to death um, by the spirit of God. Um, and that's what we are supposed to do, that by the spirit, we are to put to death the the sinful desires and the sinful nature where we see it in ourselves phil actually and uh, bob hadeen with bob hadeen had just read a book by john owen on that very subject um and that's that's something that we we have to realize that it's god has given us a way to put to death um the the sinful nature and the sin that dwells within us to mortify it to put it to death um and every human effort to do that will fail um, if it is not in step with the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, with his prescribed means. So, um, you know, make your list of, of, of um, types of asceticism. Like, I don't do this, I don't do that, or I fast, or I do things to, you know, no, it's it's what God has given us as the means for for putting um, putting sin to death, putting the flesh, uh, sinful nature to death. Uh, let me ask a question. So we just summarized. We just did the first paragraph. Um, how should this how should this inform Windsor Baptist Church? And maybe we can focus uh, on that paragraph as it is to the left of the shared screen how should this um how can this help us as windsor baptist church well i think one one thing that we have to uh be conscious of in this particular chapter is the importance of worshiping god uh and certainly uh pr protecting his sabbath uh and and making it a day that uh, that involves worship and praise for all that God has done. I, uh, it's not something that should ever be uh, taken lightly. Uh, it's some, you know, if we're going to love God in the way that he requires, we, we should make sure that uh, we set time aside for, for worship and praise and, and being thankful for all that, that he has done. I think uh, it's very important for us to, to realize that you know, that, that gathering together for worship is a, an extremely important thing. At least, you know, that's what I see in this, in this first paragraph. You know, if, if we never get together uh, as, as a congregation in, in worship and praise, uh, I think that that will have a, an adverse effect on our spiritual life. I, I agree with that. I, I also... Um... In a, in a different direction looking at it, I think it also frees us up from a lot of man-made restrictions we put on worship. Um, you know, whether it's the music, whether it's the order of service, whether it's liturgy versus um, spontaneity, I mean, you name it. There are a number of things that um, even the... Uh, <laughs> The sacred items in the in the church right and this should free us up from a lot of those to go you know 
are we worshiping God here or are we trying to put in a whole bunch of our own rules? Um, mm. that, that's one of my big takeaways for Windsor particularly. Also too, also too, if we look at the first four commandments, uh, that uh, they pretty well sum up what we're, what we're way we're supposed to come to God and worship him. Yeah, that's good. That's called the first tablet of the law, right? Yeah. I, I think also uh, yeah, to Phil's point just now as well, I think we have to be very, very careful not to add elements of worship uh, that are, are not to be added. Uh, and, you know, that can happen uh, in, in the church setting. It can. Uh, we think about, you know, the, the, the proper elements of, you know, and I'll just use one example. I, I do think uh, that with the way that we practice, I think we are, we've made a conscious uh, effort to practice uh, our faith in accordance with scripture. And I believe that, you know, the observance of the Lord's table is an example of that. You know, we, we follow the doctrine as it is written, uh -huh. first Corinthians uh, 11. And, and we, uh, we, we try to make sure that we are doing it uh, in accordance with scripture. I think, you know, singing hymns uh, as part of worship is certainly biblical uh, because, you know, it's, it's written that way. And, you know, the Psalms tell us that, you know, and certainly in the early church, you know, the Psalms in many cases were used as, as religious songs. But again, again, I think we have to be a little bit on guard for, for some elements of worship that uh, are not scriptural. And I think that's the warning that we have in, in some of this discussion that we've had this afternoon. Uh, we have to be careful about that because God has established how he wants us to worship him. And he doesn't need anything added to it because he forgot to put it in. You know, and that's, that's the thing we have to be careful of. Good, good point, Gordon. I am um, also thinking about, um, you know, it says of religious worship and the Sabbath day. Uh, we've been talking mostly about worship in light of on the Sabbath day, or I have at least. Um, but clearly in, in everything we've talked about today, the heart of us in our worship is a seven day a week, 24 hour a day thing. Um, it's not just, <laughs> it's not just on the Sabbath day and, and God's prescription for how we worship him includes all seven days. Um, so, uh, I think it encourages us as, as a body to be consistent throughout the week as well. Sure. No, I, Hey, a scripture would, would, would support that comment. So, I mean, we are to pray without ceasing. That's continually, you know, right is communion with God, right? So all those things are, you know, are daily activities. I agree. Yeah. Good. A any other comments from anybody? Thoughts that have come up with this? I think it's uh, good that they mentioned uh, or the suggestions of Satan. And that that is um, maybe not where you were going with yours, Gordon, but um, that I think that's super helpful because um, there are there are things that people call worship which are not. There's a new worship center that was built down the street from us um, in Guthriesville on 322, which used to be the Village Hardware Store, and um, now it's a Hindu worship center. And um, that, of course, that is that is one of the great deceptions of Satan, you know, Hinduism. But, but um, we have to be aware that such practices and kinds of worship do not come into the church. Um, yeah, anything like it. It's um, the kind of meditation that Psalm 1 talks about is very different than what is in the Hindu religion, which is trying to create a vacuum. Uh, in your head, um, in your mind, just like getting rid of everything. Uh, yeah, but there are many, many deceptions of Satan out there that are, that are called worship that 
Well, you know, it's interesting too about that too, Pastor, uh, you know, in, in a number of the scriptures that we read today, especially in Matthew 4, uh, if, if Satan took a shot at Jesus and tried to tempt him away from God, surely he's going to do that to us as well. Uh, I thought one comment I shared, I think I shared this with you earlier today, uh, which I, I felt was a very powerful comment and, and certainly uh, sound advice is knowing that we can be tempted by Satan uh, on some things that, you know, would take us away from the way that we worship God and the way he intends. Uh, what you said in your message this morning is doubt your doubts about those things. And then secondly, and, and certainly most importantly, is desire to be drawn closer to God. And I think that uh, that is always going to be a prayer, in my view anyway, it will always be a prayer that will be within God's will. You know, that will align with God's will for me to want to be drawn closer to him. And, uh, you know, as I get older, uh, I, I feel that. I do. I, I, I feel that I am closer to God than I once was, but I'm not as close as I want to be. You know, I have to keep working at that. That's good. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I'd like for us to uh, wrap it up right here. And uh, if we could ask, if I could ask um, Ray Kowalski, would you close us in prayer? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you with this, for this time that uh, you've given us to study your word. And Father, uh, uh, turn us uh, uh, closer to you, turn us closer to you and have us worship you uh, uh, with your scripture. Uh, let us be mindful of that as we uh, go about uh, our daily walk, as we go about uh, our worship on Sabbath. And uh, have us be mindful of that in our conversations uh, that we have uh, with others. Uh, Father, we, we thank you for this time and uh, bless us as we leave from here. We ask this in your son's most precious name, our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.